you want one? Fancy a little peppermint? It's just the mug. I don't care if there's nothing in it. There's one just, in your dressing room with your name looks, on there. Is it? Yeah. Oh. Got your own one. Yay. It's lovely. Welcome back to this morning. It's lovely to have you with us. Our money man, Martin Lewis, is joining us now to answer some of your questions. But before we get started, uh, Martin, your show's back tonight, is that right? This week? It is, yeah, on every Tuesday, 8 o'clock ITV, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a big one tonight, lots of reclaimed stuff. So um, PPI may be back, so anyone who's had a loan or a credit card or a mortgage, you may still be due money again, that's quite complex. Students, there is a big reclaim. Many, a million people who are repaying their student loan have overpaid and are due hundreds of pounds back. That's quite an easy one. I'll be talking through that in detail. And then there's quite an urgent deadline about bereavement payments. Uh, it used to be you could only get bereavement payments if you had lost a spouse. But now if you have a common law partner and you have children, in some circumstances you're entitled to bereavement pay and this can be backdated going back many years. So it's a really vital issue to get out there because that is not going to be around for very long. People won't be able to claim for long and some people are getting 10 or 20,000 pounds back. So I'll be running through all those reclaims and lots more in my news you can use. It's in the show tonight at 8 o'clock on ITV. Do watch please or at least set your beta max. We never miss it, Martin. We never miss it. Never. Uh, it's lovely to speak to you today, mate. Uh, should we get straight to it, Em? Yes, let's. Who we got? Uh, uh, right, Martin, Dorrit has uh, sent a message. My car insurer still hasn't sorted my car after an accident. My car insurance is with Tesco. I had an accident nearly a year ago and Tesco still have not fixed my car. Uh, the car failed well, its MOT. I've just lost my feed, so I can't hear oh. you anymore, but I think I got most of the question. Hopefully that will be sorted back as I answer. Um, when it comes to car insurance, <sighs> This is a very frustrating situation. I'm just going to get it back one second and hopefully I can hear this you again. This is the magic Hello. of life, Kelly. He's like, he's like a wizard. Look at him, Martin Lewis. You got us? I've got you back. OK, there we go. very right. quickly, the end so of it. Look, the car uh, failed its MOT yeah. and she's had to pay nearly £700 to have it passed. What can she do? Right, so look, it's an incredibly frustrating situation. It sounds like Tesco should have sorted it, and because they haven't sorted it, you're out of pocket. Now, like any financial services company these days, insurers are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, and it has, now has what's called the consumer duty in place, which means they have a duty to look after consumers as consumers would expect to be looked after. This is even stronger than the old treating customer fairly rules. Now, it seemed to me, if you've had an accident, they haven't repaired it, and that's caused knock-on costs to you, the right way you should be treated is it should be paying the knock-on costs. So I'd be getting in touch with Tesco now. I would be writing a formal letter of complaint. You can email it through, but you want to note this is a formal complaint and to go through to their formal complaints procedure. They then have a little bit of time to respond to you. Uh, if they respond to you favourably, great. If they don't, then I would take them to the free financial ombudsman service. This is not something that's really complicated. You can just go and do it online. It's filling in a form. You do not have to write in legalese and posh. Dear Sir Madden, on the contemporary debt, none of that. Just tell them what happened like you've written to us and told us what happened, and they will then adjudicate whether the insurer should be uh, recompensing you for the money that you've shelled out that you think was unfair. And it sounds to me like in this case you have a pretty good case, but of course I've only got scant details. Absolutely. Well, Dorit, we hope that's helped you out. Uh, Diane's been in touch as well, Martin. Uh, she's worried about a pension and getting some money back. Uh, you mentioned on one of your programmes that people who had years of national insurance missing due to being at home with children would receive a letter saying that those years would be backfold so that they are then entitled to the full pension. Unfortunately, Diane's got missing years because her husband had claimed child benefit and paid £3,133 to fill in those years. Is she entitled to that refund? OK, so that's very interesting. Yeah, hundreds of thousands of women who... Uh, hundreds of thousands of people, mainly women, who took time off work to look after children between sort of around 1980 and 2010 are receiving letters at the moment from HMRC. So don't bin them. They are not a scam, these letters. That's really important to know uh, about the fact that you were entitled to home responsibilities uh, pr uh, protection. I may have got the last P wrong, um, which means that you uh, should get your national insurance years filled in uh, when you, without paying for them. And there are a lot of those letters going out. Now, in this case, you've made a voluntary overpayment. Now, the rule at HRC for voluntary overpayments is if you've done it and you did it because of an error in your national insurance years, which I think HRP missing is an error in your national insurance years, then it should give you that money back. But it is done on a case-by-case -case basis, so I can't guarantee it. But what I would absolutely do in your circumstances, I would write 
to HMRC, request to have your voluntary national insurance contributions, that £3,000, paid back to you because you were only paying it because they mistakenly had not filled in your national insurance years with Home Responsibilities Protection. He's so wise. I was going to say, I took the words out of my mouth. I, I just get say, lost I love in your his knowledge. eyes. I know. I love your knowledge, Martin. Um, right, this Thank has you. come Thank in from you. Gareth. I've tried to open a government help to save account for my wife who is disabled. However, she doesn't have any of the required documentation she needs to open one because of her disability. She doesn't have a driving licence because she can't drive, no valid passport or any P60s because she hasn't worked for over seven years. Can you offer any advice? So, first of all, Help to Save is an amazing savings account. There is nothing that beats it. It's offered by the government. It's for people on low income, specifically people who are receiving some form of means-tested benefit, but they're in work, and there is a criteria of what counts as work. And then what you can do is you can save up to £50 a month over two years, and then even if you take money amount out, the maximum amount you had in, they give you a 50% bonus. So imagine you put 50 quid in a month for six months. For a year, you've got 600 quid. You then have to take it out because your fridge is broken and you can't keep the food cold for your kids and it's an emergency and you don't put any more in. Because the most you had over two years was 600 pounds, you would still get half of that, 300 pounds as a bonus. Unbeatable, untouchable. Anyone on universal credit or tax credits who's in work, you should be looking at whether you can open a help to save account. This is about ID issues. Now, interestingly, I put a help to save video out on social media yesterday that lots of people have watched talking about how good it is. And I've had quite a few responses on ID issues. And I already have a question in to the Department for Work of Pensions and, and HMRC saying, OK, quite a few people are telling me they don't have the required ID. What do they do? Unfortunately, the but is, I do not have an answer back yet. So if I could ask Tilly, our wonderful producer, can you ask me this question next week when I should have an answer? And then I will say what you should do. Consider it done, Martin. We will definitely do that. Uh, lastly, I want to get this one in, Martin. Uh, Christina wants to talk about thresholds. Uh, Martin, you said that earning over £50,000 affects child benefit and you have to inform HMRC as you will pay more tax on it. Now, I feel sure that the HMRC website says that it's only if that's your net income that is more than £50,000. Please, can you clarify that? I can. So this is something that drives people nuts. If you earn over, if you have a single earner earning over £50,000, it starts to reduce what you get in child benefit and it's claimed back through a tax charge. Over £60,000, you don't get it, which leaves us in the perverse situation that if you're a two-parent family, one of you earns sixty grand, you effectively don't get any child benefit. But... If there's two, it's a two-person family, you both earn £49,999, you get the full amount, which is absolutely ridiculous. Mm. It should be changed, but it won't be changed. That's the way it works. Now, when we're talking income, I understand the confusion. It's, it's close to gross income, your pre-tax income. It's not your net, your after-tax income. What they're actually looking at is what's called your adjusted net income. Now, what that means is that's your salary before tax. And for most people, it means take off any pension contributions and take off any gift aid given to charity, whatever's left, but it's not taking off tax. So for most people, it's going to be quite close to their pre-tax income minus pension contributions, which will have it work. That's what they're looking at when it comes to this. Just one, while we're on child benefit, I've given this warning before, but it's so important. <clears throat> if you are, have a non-working parent, always make sure the non-working parent is the person who registers for the child benefit unless there are financial abuse issues going on in the family. That, that always trumps it, obviously, because that way they get the national insurance credits for the state pension. The same too, if one of you is earning over 60 grand and the other isn't working, you should still register for child benefit and you should claim zero. So claim nothing because the claiming of that is what triggers your national insurance credit for the state pension. So even if you're not going to get child benefit, then you should register to get it and not and claim nothing rather than just not register to get it because you want it for your national insurance. But the answer to the question is basically pre-tax earning minus, minus any pension contribution. Martin, thank you thank so you, much. Martin. We'll be watching tonight, 8pm on ITV1 and ITVX. Thanks, Martin. See Thanks. you soon. Uh, right, stay with us.